you should all get some message saying asking if you're happy to be um and i'm glad to introduce again alison kolosova um who is with us from uh the chuvash republic of russia and um uh, you're going to talk about nikolai Ilminskia, is that right? An Orthodox oh, mission yes. among the Turkic and you know, Ugric peoples. And um, uh, I've had some fascinating conversations with Alison um, for various different reasons over the last months and uh, some really interesting things to hear. And again, probably for, for many people at OCMS, um, a region that we don't really know much about um, and particularly any long sort of historical um, uh, things going on there. So I'm really looking forward to this. What I'll do is I'll start the slideshow and then share my screen when I've got that one up and running. Um, yes, I think I might need to, I know what I need to do, yeah. I have to tell it to swap the displays and then I can do this slides on one uh, that's it very good and I shall share the screen and it should be just there so that should be everybody seeing something that looks like a slide mm -hmm. And I need to be sure to be on the right one too. So Ruth, if you'll just give me a nod when you want me to move the slides on. Um, and uh, otherwise over to you, yes? Right, okay, well, thank you very much. Yes, and I'm, I'm very glad to be with you again. And thank you for giving me a, a second chance. And thank <laughs> you to Ralph for his help with the uh, technical, um, technical kind of issues connected with uh, speaking to you from the Chuvash Republic. Um, okay, um, in this lecture, we're going to focus on a man who many would argue had the greatest influence in transforming attitudes to Christian mission in 19th century Russia, and whose influence is felt to this day. This is Nikolai Ilminsky. He has been an extremely controversial figure, however, both in his own day and at present, although there are signs that attitudes towards him are changing. In order to grasp his significance, we need to understand something of the broader historical background to his work and of attitudes to mission in the Russian Orthodox Church before his time. So Ilminsky is a useful figure to study if you want to get a broad picture of the missionary work of the Russian church over the last few centuries. My aims for this lecture then are, first of all, to provide something of that broader picture then to focus in on the missionary movement inspired by Ilminsky, then to give examples of the, some of the controversies his missionary activity has aroused. Uh, next slide, please, Well, <clears throat> Yeah, uh -huh, thank you. Um, if you go about 500 miles in almost any direction from Moscow, you will quickly discover that many of the local people are in fact not Russian. If you travel directly east of Moscow, you find yourself in a region along the Volga River, where today there are smaller republics named after the ethnic group that predominates, such as the Tatars or the Chuvash. Nikolai Ilminsky lived in Kazan, which today is the capital of Tatarstan, where the majority speak the Tatar language and are Muslim, although there is a small Tatar Christian community as well. I'm speaking to you from the Chuvash Republic, which is named after the Chuvash, who are another ethnic group of Turkic origin. One of my neighbors is Chuvash, but others are Mordvins, who give their name to the neighboring Republic of Mordovia. The Mordvins speak a finno ugric language. The Finns and the Hungarians are peoples of the finno ugric language group who are best known in Western Europe. But there are many other smaller finno ugric peoples scattered across the north of Russia, and my Mordvin neighbours are from one of these, as are two other peoples in our region known as the Mari and the Udmurts. 
So this is a region where Turkic and Finno Ugric peoples have mingled over many centuries and yet have kept their own languages and distinct cultural traditions. Today, each of these peoples has its own national republic with a president and parliament which governs local affairs, although they are overall within the Russian Federation. They also have their own cultural and religious traditions, which are important to understand in any discussion of Christian mission. From now on, I shall frequently re refer to this group of peoples as the mid Volga peoples, just to save time and to not have to um, give the names of all the peoples all the time. Okay, uh, next slide, please, Ralph. Um, let us now look briefly at the different kinds of religious influences on these peoples over the centuries, which account for what are often referred to today as the traditional beliefs and rites of the mid Volga peoples. First of all, the Khazars were a Turkic people who created the Khazar Khanate, which dominated the trade routes to the north of the Black and Caspian Seas from the 7th to 10th centuries. The Khazar elite adopted Judaism in the ninth century, but there were also Muslims and Christians within Khazaria, owing to the trade routes with Central Asia, Byzantium and the Caucasus mountains. We need to remember that the Armenians and Georgians of the Southern Caucasus had both adopted Christianity by the fifth century. And there is evidence of their presence also along the Volga trade routes. Um, on the map you can see here, you can just see the, the Volga River uh, running up the, the right hand side of the map. Among those who paid tribute to the Khazars were the peoples of the mid Volga, who at that time were ruled over by the Volga Bulgars, another Turkic people related ethnically to the Khazars who had migrated up the Volga and traded and exacted tribute from the finno ugric peoples who in, inhabited the region. So you can see this big, uh, big pink splodge uh, in the middle of the Volga region, okay, just on the right hand side of the map. In the early 10th century, the Bulgar Khan sought religious instruction for his people and an alliance with the Caliph of Baghdad in order to protect his domains from the Khazar overlords. In 922, Ibn Fadlan was sent from Baghdad as emissary of the Abbasid Caliph to Khan Almush of Volga Bulgaria to preach Islam among the Volga Bulgars. Although the townspeople and native elites converted to Islam, how much Islam spread among forest and village dwellers is still a matter of debate. There was also influence from the West and the North, the Slavs of Kiev and Rus, and you can see Kiev um, in the middle of this map, uh, in the West and from Scandinavian Vikings who traded and raided down the Volga at this time. Um, for example, in 965, Prince Sviatoslav of Kiev invaded Khazaria and attacked the Volga Bulgars. And in 988, uh, Prince Vladimir of Kiev converted to Orthodox Christianity. Owing to trade links between Rus and Volga Bulgaria, there was Christian influence from at least this time in the mid Volga. Much of our knowledge of the peoples of Volga Bulgaria at this time comes from Arab travelers, merchants and teachers such as Aben, Ibn Fadlan mentioned uh, above, who left a description of the first preaching of Islam in 922. And the next slide, please, Rolf. Uh, I'd like to read an extra, extract from the writings of Abu Hamid al-Andalusi, who, who as his name suggests, was an Arab from Andalusia in Spain and who traveled to Volga, Bulgaria and Kievan Rus in 1135. He gives a feel of the religious diversity of this region at that time. He describes, first of all, a city on the Volga called Saxin. And uh, you can see on this slide, uh, let's read this. There are mosques in the city where the prayers are said on Fridays for the Khazars, who likewise are divided into various tribes. In the centre of the town lives an emir of the Bulgars, who has a great mosque in which to say the Friday prayers, and round about live the different tribes of Bulgars. 
On feast days, they set up many pulpits and each emir prays in front of many nations. And then he travel, tells us about his, uh, his voyage down the river to visit the Slavs. Uh, I continue to read, I left Bulgar and traveled by boat down the river of the Slavs. When I reached the land of the Slavs, I saw that it was very large and rich in honey, wheat and barley. The Slavs have very strict norms of behavior and are brave. Like the Byzantines, they are Nestorian Christians. And then he tells us about some other people there, apart from the, the Muslims of Bulgar and the, the Christians of Kiev. He tells us there are a people around there who live in the woods and shave their beards. They live by a great river and hunt beavers. Their country is safe. They pay taxes to Bulgar. They have no revealed religion and worship a kind of tree before which they bow down. So we can see from this text that in the early 20th, 12th century, the mid Volga was a region of great ethnic and religious diversity with a strong Islamic pres presence, the influence of Orthodox Christianity, yet also those who have no revealed religion, uh, that is no book and worship a kind of tree. And we'll return to this worship of trees later on. Uh, next slide, please, Well. Uh, the year 1237, aha, that's right. The year 1237 was a major watershed in the history of this region, as the Volga Bulgars and Kievan Rus were conquered by the Mongol Tatars. On the whole, in the Mongol Empire, local peoples were allowed to retain their own religious beliefs, and Islam continued to predominate in the Middle Volga. In the mid 15th century, the Golden Horde, which was the Western regions of the Mongol Empire, splintered into smaller Khanates. And in 1438, the Kazan Khanate was formed with the local Turkic and Finno Ugric peoples becoming tribute paying peoples to Kazan. Their lands were continuously fought over as Tatar and Russian raiding parties went back and forth. Yet there is also evidence of Christian preaching and influence at this time. For example, we know of a merchant of Turkic Bulgar origin, Avrami, a Muslim who converted to Christianity and taught the gospel in the marketplaces of Volga, Bulgaria. We know of him as he was martyred in 1229 and his body was brought to Muscovite Russia. And also in the early 15th century, Abbot Makari of the Russian Orthodox Church baptized local people near his monastery of the Yellow Waters Lake, not far from Kazan. So just to summarize this period before the Russian conquest of 1552, uh, there was a very great variety of religious influences on the Volga peoples. Um, the majority of the population were forest dwellers or nomadic or semi-nomadic, so the religions of the book preached in the towns may have had little impact. How influenced they would have, would have been would have depended on whether they were located close to towns or monasteries and with which peoples they had trading contacts. Okay, uh, next slide, please, uh, Ralph. Another key date in the history of this region uh, is 1552, the year of the Russian conquest of Kazan and the Mid-Volga region. Many Soviet and Tatar scholars argue that after the conquest, there, was com there were conversion campaigns, which they depict as state-initiated violence. But this view of orthodoxy being forced on the Volga peoples by coercion has been challenged recently by some scholars. Agnes Kefeli, who is a, a French scholar with Turkic roots and with distinct sympathy for the Tatars and the Muslim Tatars, nevertheless argues that Tsar Ivan the Terrible did not make conversion to Christianity a condition for Tatars to enter Russian service. And not all the mosques were destroyed in Kazan, although some of them certainly were. Um, there is evidence of both aggressive resistance by the local population, but also of small numbers who began peaceful collaboration with the Russian settlers and were ba baptized into the Orthodox Christian faith. 
people such as the Mordvins and the Chuvash, who I mentioned at the start, actually took part in the Russian offensive against the Kazan Tatars. You could say they were almost, they were within Russia uh, in a kind of loose kind of way before the Russian invasion. Um, there were two main waves of encounter with Orthodox Christianity before the 19th century. Uh, the first was during the 16th and 17th centuries when monasteries were founded alongside the Russian forts which were built to defend the new borders. Russian peasants settled on the lands, forests and lakes which the Tsar granted to the monasteries. And some of the indigenous local peoples also settled on these lands and served in the Russian armed forces with which many had collaborated before the 1552 conquest. Monasteries uh, such as in Kazan and Sviazhsk, and um, the map you can see on the right um, on the right of the slide, <clears throat> um, you can't see actually see the names of any of the places, but again you can see the Volga River at least, and you can see here in the corner you can see Kazan itself, um, and uh, on this map the uh, the pink color is Russian people, so you can see that along the river. And also in quite a lot of kind of small areas, there are these kind of pink areas of Russian settlement. Um, and then you can see the other local peoples. So the, the yellow are the more the Mari, uh, the gray are the, the Chuvash, and uh, the brown areas around Kazan are Tatars. But you can see um, that a lot of the region, uh, th this is obviously this is not in uh, immediate after the conquest, but also in the by the 17th century. Um, now, during the 18th century, uh, Orthodox missionary work took a more official turn. Um, in 1740, the Office for the Affairs of the Newly Baptized was set up. Material incentives such as release from conscription to the army and release from taxes were used to encourage people to be baptized. And by 1763, almost 95% of the Chuvash, Mari, Mordova, and Udmots were registered as baptized. Some scholars argued that the state viewed baptism as a way to integrate the mid Volga peoples into the administrative structure of the empire as it involved writing down their names and locations as in a census. And that therefore this, this kind of baptism of these peoples was not primarily religiously motivated. Um, nevertheless, churches were built in central native villages, uh, but Orthodox services were held in Slavonic and the clergy were almost entirely Russian. Those who were baptized into the Orthodox church in the mid 18th century are known today as the newly baptized. And the 18th century conversions are today portrayed extremely negatively by most mid vulgar scholars. Um, even those who would consider themselves uh, Christians today, they usually consider it led to a purely superficial Christianity with no real knowledge of the faith and that it naturally paved the way for people reconverting to Islam from the late 18th century onwards and to the preservation of indigenous rites and beliefs and a syncretistic mixture of orthodoxy with local traditions. But there was another side to these first attempts at Christianizing the peoples of the mid Volga. Uh, in the late 18th century, the first attempts at creating written languages, alphabets and grammars for the mid Volga peoples took place. Orthodox catechisms were translated into the vernacular for the Volga peoples. Although most people were illiterate, they would have been used by Orthodox clergy to try to preach to their congregations. And for example, um, the first grammar of the Chuvash language where I live uh, was compiled in 1769 um, and 1775 were the first Mari and Udmurt grammars. And these were really combi compiled uh, so as to write catechisms to, to teach the local people the faith. Um, alongside this, schools for the newly baptized were founded in larger towns such as Kazan uh, for the training of indigenous students as deacons and priests. The training took place at that time in Russian or Slavonic, so it had definitely a Russifying effect, and yet a small number of bilingual clergy arose, 
and it was these who worked on the first grammars and catechisms. In 1787, for example, it was reported that there were 15 native students at the Kazan Seminary, and this was regarded as, a, as an experiment. Um, in contrast to the policies of forced baptisms of the early 18th century, during the reign of Catherine the Great, and she reigned for over 30 years towards the end of the 18th century, a policy of religious tolerance was declared. In 1788, she created a Muslim muftiate uh, responsible for overseeing Muslim communities and Islamic schools and for appointing mullahs. She needed to ensure the loyalty of her Muslim subjects during the Russo-Turkish wars and following Russia's annexation of the Crimea in 1783. So until that time, the Crimea uh, was under Turkey or the, the Ottoman Empire. Catherine's policy involved toleration of the existence of non-Orthodox religions and Christian confessions on Russian soil, but it was forbidden by law to convert from Orthodoxy to Islam or to other Christian confessions. The next slide, uh, please, Rolf. Um, so, uh, Largely as, as a result of these tolerant policies of Catherine the Great, um, there was a, a, an Islamification or re-Islamification of the mid-Volga region in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, a reform movement within Sufism from the 16th century led to two Sufi orders, the Yasawiya and the Naqshbandiya, forgive me those of you who speak Arabic, um, taking firmer root in the Kazan region in the late 18th century. The disciples of two major sheikhs from Bukhara and Kabul served as wandering preachers. In the same way as the first Orthodox printed texts were circulated among the Volga peoples in the late 18th century, printed texts and literacy also played a great role in the consolidation of Islam. In 1801, the Asian printing house opened in Kazan and printed in Arabic and other Asian languages, leading to the widespread distribution of Islamic texts and literacy through mosque schools. Throughout the 19th century and early 20th century, there were petitions from newly baptized Tatars and other Turkic peoples asking to revert or to con convert to Islam. Tatar nationalist historians view the Turkic peoples and particularly the Tatars as having a fixed Muslim identity defined by their national heritage. And so they interpret this desire to convert to Islam as a natural desire to return to their Turkic roots. Uh, Agnes Kefeli, who I, I mentioned earlier, uh, the French scholar, um, she challenges this view, however, in a recent book, which I've, I've given you the title of on this slide. And I would say if you want to read one book about uh, our area, I would say read this book. It's, it's a wonderful book and a wonderful piece of research. And although it's about it's describes itself as becoming Muslim, um, it is also about Ilminski and becoming Christian. Um, and it's an excellent book to read. Um, but anyway, she, she argues that this viewpoint of the Turkic peoples of the Volga being kind of inherently Muslim, uh, she says it fails to take account of the preaching role of the Sufi orders and mosque schools, which she feels led to genuine conversions and a deeply rooted popular Islam in the Volga Kama region in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, the next slide, please, uh, Rolf. Um, so how did the Russian Orthodox Church respond to this renewed spread of Islam around Kazan? Well, in 1842, the Kazan Orthodox Seminary was upgraded with the aim of training qualified missionaries for the Volga region and languages such as Arabic, Tatar, Mongolian and Kalmyk uh, were taught at the seminary. Um, in 1847, a committee was set up to translate the Orthodox liturgy into the Tatar language using the literary language of the mosques and using the Arabic script. And um, it's perhaps not very clear, but on this slide, you can actually see um, an early example of a, an Orthodox catechism, which has been translated into Tatar and it's using the Arabic script on the, the right hand column, you can see. Um, 
Um, and it's in this translation of the Orthodox liturgy into Tatar that uh, Ilminski comes into the picture. You might have wondered uh, where he's got lost amidst all of this, but um, this is the point where he really comes on the scene because he was part of this committee that translated the liturgy into Tatar. Um, he'd studied uh, he'd studied both Arabic and Tatar, and he'd learned Tatar from speaking to the Tatars in Kazan. Um, he began, however, to question the use of the literary Tatar language, as he knew that it was not understood by Tatar Christians who had not been educated in the mosques. So the literary language up to that time was, was largely a language of, of the mosques and of uh, the Muslim Tatars. And um, this is a, a quote from him in 1847, that the translation of Christian church services into the Tatar language being the most important means towards the rebirth by grace of the Tatars should be marked by living popular speech. I'm going to sleep now. Yes, I'm going to get my notebook. Thank you. Hello. <laughs> um, so why did Ilminski have such an emphasis on use of the vernacular language? Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Yes, okay, right, right. I thought I'd lost you somehow. Okay, um, now on the one hand, it was a practical issue of what was understood by the Tatar Christians that Ilminski knew. On the other hand, we need to tie in Ilminski's emphasis on the vernacular with translations into Alaskan vernacular languages from the 1820s to 40s um, that Father Michael Alexa told us about two weeks ago. Um, Ilminski knew of these translations and also of vernacular translations at the Altai mission in Siberia. And a more overarching influence on all of these first vernacular translations was the Russian Bible Society, which existed from 1812 to 1826. And it was set up under the influence of the British and Foreign Bible Society. Um, as you can see, it closed down in 1826. This was the beginning of the reign of Tsar Nicholas I, who was uh, quite a kind of conservative Tsar. Um, and uh, the Russian Bible Society was closed down owing to the influence of conservatives in the Russian church who opposed translations into the Russian vernacular, which had been carried out by the Russian Bible Society. Yet there were some very senior figures in the Russian church at the time. Uh, these included perhaps the most uh, famous person of, of the 19th century Russian church, was Metropolitan Filaret Drazdov of Moscow, and uh, a, a friend, and you could say very much a, a kind of um, fellow fellow traveler concerning uh, the translation into vernacular languages. Um, and this was Archbishop Grigori of Kazan. And this would have been the reason he was sent to Kazan at this time really was because of his emphasis on using vernacular languages. Um, and I would say these two figures, I, I would argue, were the, the main inspiration for these vernacular translations out on the borders of the Russian Empire. So the, the Alaskan translations, the Altai translations, and these translations that we're hearing about in the mid-Volga. Um, the next slide, please. Um, thank you. Um, so let's see how this Archbishop Grigori of Kazan influenced the situation in Kazan. Now, in 1848 and 1849, um, Grigori, he, he asked Ilminski to travel around the baptized Tartar villages, um, largely because he wanted to know what was actually happening in these villages. He wanted to know, you know what people believed. Were, were they becoming Muslim? Um, he, he really had no idea. People didn't really travel to these villages. Um, people didn't know the language of the people in the villages. And so he sent Ilminski because he knew Tata. Uh, Ilminski had learned the living Tata language by enrolling at a Muslim med medressa in Kazan. And he lived in Kazan's Tata quarter. 
Uh, he wrote at the time that he tried above all to familiarize himself with the inner life of Muslims, with official Muslim teachings, practices, popular beliefs and customs. And from 1851 to, sorry, sorry, I missed. Um, and in 1849, he wrote what is known as the proposal for Tatar mission. And in this, he criticized previous missionaries who did not speak Tatar nor have any understanding of Islam. He stressed the need for Tatar speaking priests who at seminary would study Arabic and Muslim theology, the Quran and other sources of Islamic teaching. And from 1851 to 1854, Ilminski was sent by Archbishop Grigori to the Middle East to prepare as a lecturer for these courses. He lived in Cairo and he studied Arabic, he studied Sufism, um, and he also got to know the Roman Catholic and Protestant missions. Uh, he was greatly struck by the use of Arabic in the Orthodox liturgy in the Middle East and the use of vernacular Arabic in Protestant mission schools. In 1854, Ilminski returned to Kazan and until 1858, he taught Islamic studies at the Kazan Orthodox Academy. And uh, this is from a, a speech here we can see in 1856. Um, a speech he made at the Kazan Academy, uh, where he said, for our proofs and conclusions to be understandable and persuasive for Tatars, we cannot use our Christian sources and historical data, but on the contrary, we must take a Muslim viewpoint and take as given their religious opinions and stories, which for Muslims are powerful and true. Many of the truths within Islam, their idea of God as a supreme personal being endowed with all the perfections, all these beliefs corrected and developed can provide a bridge into Christian teaching. And the, the title of this slide, I've, um, I've called it uh, the Nikolai Minsky and the anti-Islamic studies in Kazan. Um, perhaps rather unfortunately for him today, uh, the department which he was in charge of in Kazan was called the, the if literally translated as the anti-Islamic department, which obviously today, you know, um, does not uh, foster kind of the idea that he was uh, promoting kind of good relations with Muslims. But in fact, if you read a lot of what he wrote, for example, this, uh, this quote that I have here on the slide, um, you know, he, he was the person who most promoted um, understanding Islam from within, um, within the Russian church in the 19th century. And so it's kind of rather tragic that because of the title of his department or the name of his department, uh, he's been kind of branded as being anti-Islamic. Um, now in 1858, there were two major crises in his thinking. Um, one was that Ilminski's views began to cause controversy and his Islamic mission department with its in-depth teaching of Islam was disbanded at the Kazan Academy. Um, another further crisis was that in 1856, Ilminski had gone to the baptized Tata villages to try out the new Tata translations of the Orthodox liturgy. And he found that they were, they were not understood at all. And so in an 1858 report, he proposed schools where teaching would be in Tatar and Russian with text translated into the spoken Tatar language using the Cyrillic alphabet rather than the Arabic script. Um, during 1865 and 1866, there was a wave of reconversions to Islam by baptized Tatars and among other vulgar peoples against the background of the 1860s abolition of serfdom. Um, the issue of orthodox Muslim relations and how to prevent the vulgar peoples from converting to Islam became crucial. Both church and state officials began to take more notice of Ilminski's views. Um, and the next slide, please. Um, Ilminski's activities and developing convictions at this time led to two main strategies towards Islam in late 19th century Kazan. The first was the approach of polemic or dialogue. Um, Orthodox seminarians in Kazan studied the Quran and its most famous commentators, as well as Sufi religious literature. 
This was to prepare them for dialogue with local mullahs and ordinary Muslims. Um, however, many of the Russian priests in Tatar villages were critical of this approach and argued that Islamic Christian polemics only fueled the conversion movement towards Islam. Uh, recent Tatar scholarship denounces Russian, the Russian missionaries' hostility to Islam and their failure to convert Tatars to Christianity. Um, but I, I'd again like to refer to Agnes Kefili, um, who, despite being very sympathetic to the Muslim position, she argues that how, however hostile they were to Islam, the Russian missionaries had some understanding of popular or lived Islam and the texts that undergirded it. Now, the, the second strategy, which really was the one that in the end became associated with Nikolai Ilminsky, um, was the, the, he had two main principles, one of which we've already uh, encountered, and this was the vernacular translations of biblical and orthodox texts. Um, his other main principle, which kind of goes hand in hand, obviously, with vernacular translations, uh, was that of indigenous agency and le leadership. Um, that there should be teachers and orthodox clergy who spoke the local languages as their mother tongue. Um, now, yes, uh, can we have the next slide, please, uh, Ralph? Um, although Ilminski was criticized, criticized for the inaccurate inaccuracy of the translations by those who thought native languages were too primitive to reflect Christian truths, he staunchly defended his translations as the only way to bring about the conversion of the hearts of the Tatars, which would prevent their adoption of Islam. And um, this is a, another quote from his writings at that, this time, when he wrote that the translations can convey so much Christian dogmatic, moral and liturgical material that the most active and leading personalities from among the baptized Tatars will be able to imbibe Christianity into their consciousness and heart as integ integrally whole and efficacious teaching. Christianity as a living source, as a leaven in a dough, will itself act on their thinking and feeling. And having been assimilated by these personalities, it will be transmitted to others from them and through them. But in this process, you must not let go of the only effective weapon, the Tartar mother tongue. We believe that the evangelical word of our savior, Jesus Christ, incarnate, so to speak, in the living and natural Tartar language, and through this language, communing most sincerely with the deepest thinking and religious consciousness of the Tartars, will bring about the Christian regeneration of this people. This text represents the core of Ilminski's teaching, an emphasis on how Christian teaching must be passed on through the leading personalities of the Tatars themselves and in their mother tongue. And just to uh, a very quick further comment is that as far as I'm aware, and this is from reading most kind of texts about mission in 19th century Russia, before this date or before this text there is no mention or use of the word incarnate uh, to speak of the evangelical word being kind of incarnated uh, in the language um, so this is uh, quite a, a key text I feel for for 19th century kind of Russian missionary theology um, so the next slide please Rolf. now how did Ilminski put this into practice um, in 1863, Ilminski and a Tatar teacher, Vasily Timofeyev, founded the Kazan Central Baptized Tatar School with Tatar pupils that Timofeyev brought from his home village. This school became a central teacher training school, educating Tatar teachers for Christian Tatar village schools. Children studied in the day and adults came for reading and prayer in the evenings with occasional Orthodox liturgical worship. In the context of this school, biblical texts such as Genesis and the Gospels of St. Matthew and St. John and the main Orthodox prayers and liturgical texts were translated into the vernacular Tatar language. And in summer 1864, Timofeyev walked around the baptized Tata villages like the wandering Sufi preachers, 
with three pupils and his left detailed descriptions in his diary. They read the first vernacular Tatar texts and they sang Orthodox prayers in Tatar, uh, taught children the alphabet in, just in the streets. This is all done in the streets and then taught them to read. Um, so on the streets they, and in the market squares, they discussed biblical and Quranic versions of stories, such as that of Joseph, who is common to both Christian and Muslim tradition. And in 1869, the first Orthodox Divine Liturgy, the central Sunday communion service of the Orthodox Church, took place in the Tatar language. And Vasily Timofeyev, the teacher, was ordained to the priesthood and services were held in Tata from this time onwards. Um, after this, a, a network of primary schools and Orthodox parishes developed using the Tata spoken language. And today, um, there is a, a small minority among the Tatars who are known as the Kreashen Tatars. And this name for them, the Kreashens, comes from the Russian word for baptized. And it's the name given to Christian Tatars who use the Tatar language in Orthodox liturgical life. Um, the next slide, please. Um, uh, in 1872, the Kazan Native Teachers Seminary was founded with Nikolai Ilminski as its director. It trained indigenous teachers for Tata, Chuvash, Modva, Mari, and Udmot peoples. And many of the teachers went on to become the first indigenous Orthodox clergy, where local languages were used for prayer and teaching. Um, in the, the photo on the left, I'm sorry that it's not very clear. You can see some of the children uh, who are actually from the primary schools that were attached to this teacher's seminary so that teachers had teaching practice. They set up uh, primary schools with children from the different language groups. And these are some of the children. Um, so among the different Volga peoples, teacher training schools were set up on the Ilminski model. For example, the Simbirsk Chuvash Teachers School, founded by Ilminsky's Chuvash follower, Ivan Yakovlev, and it trained approximately 1,000 teachers for Chuvash language schools by 1917. And there was a strong emphasis on the diffusion of Orthodox prayer texts through choral singing. Um, and you can see on the, uh, on the slide, uh, the, the lower photo, in fact, is a it's uh, a choral, it's for the choir uh, learning to sing. Um, the numbers that you can see are actually a form of musical notation. So rather than having the kind of the blobs of uh, kind of European notation, uh, they use numbers, which they thought was easier for the, the children to learn. And this was a, a kind of new form of uh, teaching music in the 1860s. I think in not only in Russia, but in Western Europe as well. Um, okay, so um, let's look briefly now at some of the consequences of Ilminsky's missionary policies and the issues raised by them, and first among the Muslim Tatars, and then secondly among the other Volga peoples. Um, and the next slide, please, um, Rolf. Um, so first of all, uh, the consequences among Russia's Muslim peoples. Um, Islam was increasingly viewed as a political threat within the Russian Empire in the late 19th century. This was due to the conquest of the North Caucasus in the 1860s and of Central Asia in the late 19th century. And this had led to increased numbers of Muslims within the Russian Empire. And as you can see, in uh, according to the 1897 census, census, there were 87 million Orthodox Christians and 14 million Muslims in the Russian Empire. And in the final decades before the 1917 revolution, Orthodoxy was increasingly seen as a part of Russian national identity, and Islam was viewed as an alien element within the Russian Empire. This led to great antagonism by Muslims who criticized criticized Ilminsky's views and schools, even though, as we've seen he, in his schools, he wasn't really openly uh, kind of preaching against um, Islam. Uh, but nevertheless, the schools were considered a threat by the Muslim community. 
um, the Alminsky schools became associated with hostility to Islam and the desire to Russify Russia's Muslim peoples by drawing them to Orthodox Christianity. So ironically, Ilminsky has been labeled as a Russifier when in fact his main aim, I would argue, was to indigenize Orthodox Christianity within local cultures by creating written languages and working through indigenous leadership. Um, in 1905, there was a, a very famous decree on religious toleration in the Russian empire. And it was highly controversial within the Russian church as in practice, it legalized conversion to Islam and to other Christian confessions. And this was for the first time, really, as uh, we noted that uh, under, since the time of Catherine and before that, it was uh, strictly speaking, it was illegal to convert to Islam from orthodoxy. Um, many of the mid Volga peoples who'd been baptized into orthodoxy between the 16th to 19th centuries, formerly registered as Muslims, but perhaps what is uh, interesting is that a significant, a significant amount remained Christian. And this also accounts for these uh, Kriash and uh, Christian Tatars who today are almost like a separate ethnic group among the Tatars. And on the slide, we can see um, their church in the center of Kazan. And on the icon, this is an icon of um, uh, the Grand Duchess Elizabeth, who was the, the sister of the last Tsarina Sar of, uh, of Russia, and she was the granddaughter of Queen Victoria, English Queen Victoria. Um, and here she is on an icon with a Tatar inscription. I'm afraid you can't see terribly well, but the, the language around her is Tatar here. So I think she would have liked that um, as, as she was. I mean, she is today considered a, a saint by the, the Russian church. Um, so the, the next uh, slide, please, Wolf. Um, now, among the other Volga peoples, after the 1905 decree on religious toleration, uh, the other mid-Volga peoples, apart from the Tatars, remained predominantly Orthodox Christian. Um, as we've seen, some did uh, adopt Islam, those who had perhaps been living uh, according to kind of Islamic, uh, the Islamic faith for, for centuries. Um, uh, and yet the majority today would still consider themselves Orthodox Christian. Um, nevertheless, uh, what happened in the Soviet period to these people? Um, well, in the Soviet period, there's been a revival of what began to be referred to as indigenous faiths or, or paganism uh, among these peoples in the Soviet period during the 20th century. And I'd like us to look for a moment how this phenomenon is related, in fact, to the Ilminsky missionary movement as well. Um, one distinct consequence of the Ilminsky missionary movement was the rise of nationalism among the Volga peoples. And this was due to the creation of written languages, the first public published texts in these languages, the rise of educated and literate indigenous intelligentsias. And as I'm sure um, everybody at uh, OCMS will know, this has been a phenomenon common to missionary movements in the context of empire around the globe. So it, it's not just something in Russia. Um, and after the 1917 revolution in Russia, it was pupils from the Ilminsky schools and the first indigenous clergy who played an important role in the creation of national republics in the mid Volga, uh, with a certain degree of political, cultural and ecclesial autonomy. So, for example, the, the Chuvash Republic, where, where I'm speaking to you from, uh, was created, if I, if I remember it rightly, in 1925. So it was very much the, the result of the 1917 re revolution and of, um, of giving kind of autonomy to, to the ethnic groups of the mid Volga. But it's interesting that um, among those who really kind of led the way, uh, paved the way for these national republics were the, the indigenous uh, clergy who, uh, who had arisen out of the Ilminsky missionary movement. 
and one reason for the renewed sense of national identity was that in the Ilminski schools, the ethnographic study of the Volga peoples, their cultural and religious traditions were strongly encouraged. And the first ethnographic texts about these peoples arose from within the Ilminski movement. After the 1917 revolution in Russia, when Marxism and atheism were promoted, this ethnographic study became divorced from its Christian background. And instead, there was an emphasis on the rediscovery of the ancient pre-Christian cultures of these peoples, which were described as pagan. Um, and this vocabulary of paganism and also of devilry, of idolatry, sadly can be traced to some of the missionaries and um, I'd like to just quickly look at one example of this if we could look at the next slide please uh, well thank you um, and I'd like to uh, focus very briefly on what was referred to in the 19th and early 20th century ethnographic texts as the old Chuvash faith uh, beliefs and practices surrounding every aspect of the lifestyle of the Chuvash uh, where, I, where I live um, and I'd like to look at the example of their sacred locations, which were sacred groves of holy trees known as Kirimets. And I'd like to look at the way these had become associated with orthodox practices of pilgrimage to holy places and icons. Um, if we could have a look at the next slide, please. As you can see again on this uh, uh, map, we can see the River Volga um, going up uh, kind of on the left hand side. Um, and we can see that the, the Chuvash were in fact scattered among across a wide area. The, uh, the red uh, kind of blocked in area is what is the Chuvash Republic today. Uh, but they also are scattered much further east as well. Um, a lot of them living among uh, the Tatars and other peoples of the Mid Volga. Um, so a, um, if we look at the next slide as well, um, accounts of the old Chuvash faith frequently mentioned sacred locations known as Kirimets, although many authors emphasize that the Kirimet was the spirit who was appeased by making offerings such as farm animals, grain and money at sacred locations, which had also acquired the name Kirimet. Uh, one of the first indigenous Chuvash Orthodox priests, Alexei uh, Rekiev, um, had this to say in 1896 that the Kirimets are the guardians or protectors of those places where they dwell. All those places where these spirits dwell are considered sacred by the Chuvash. In such places, there are sometimes sacred groves, but these groves are not themselves the Kirimets, but only the places where they dwell. The name Kirimet was attributed by ethnographers to the Ar Arabic uh, Hurmet, which means untouchable or sacred. And this term is common to all the languages of the Mid Volga and is considered to have originally referred to the graves of Muslim holy men. For example, there were many Kirimets in Chuvash districts which bore the name of Melim Khusya, a famous Sufi sheikh. And the term later took on the more general meaning of locations connected with spirits of the dead, which meant Kirimets often stood near burial sites, abandoned cemeteries and the mounds of ancient settlements. Each Tuvash village had one main Kirimet and often several smaller ones. Um, the replacement of the old sacred sites by chapels, churches and monasteries is a common feature of 19th and early 20th century texts. These reveal how prayers and offerings were often made at both the Kirimets and the Orthodox holy places, and that pilgrimage to Orthodox sacred locations, objects and people had become a marked feature of Chuvash culture. Um, well, if we have the next slide, please. Um, distant Orthodox chapels, I, uh, Ruth, just say that if we're to have time for questions, we probably need to. Um, right. Get okay. To the clock, so. Okay. Uh, let me <laughs> I'm see. completely transported by your talk, so I. I've, yes. I yes. A bit earlier, um, but... Let's let's leave this slide out then. If we can go on to the next slide. No. Um, the best example of such religious practices in the 19th century is the pilgrimage to the icon of St. Nicholas in the Chuvash village of Ishaki. Um, and near this village, there was a spring in the forest where a Kirimet spirit was believed to dwell. 
and neighbors in conflict over land or belongings went to settle their disputes. If a Chuvash wanted to take revenge on a neighbor, they would tear a piece of cloth from the neighbor's clothing, wrap a stone up in the cloth, then throw it into the spring near Ishaki so that the Kirimet would send illness on the neighbor. Um, and the next slide, please. Um, by the early 19th century, an icon of St. Nicholas in the church in Ishaki had become an object of pilgrimage. By the 1840s and 1850s, three to 4,000 pilgrims and traders traveled to the village for a three-day fair held at the time of St. Nicholas Spring Feast Day, which coincides with the end of the spring sowing in May. There was also a daily stream, stream of pilgrims throughout the year to the spring where the Ishaki icon was found. And in the 1850s, uh, one of the ethnographers wrote, it can be said without exaggeration that Ishaki in the eyes of the native people, especially the Chuvash, is a metropolis in the direct sense of the word. And they come here to pray more than to their parish churches. Um, the frequent references to sorting out disputes with enemies and neighbors before the Ishaki icon link the icon with the nearby Kirimet, where the Chuvash similarly asked for punishment on wrongdoers. And they also link the Ishaki icon with a famous carved icon of St. Nicholas, uh, which is still venerated today in the Holy Trinity Monastery in the Chuvash capital, uh, Chaboksari. And you can see this on the photograph here. Um, I don't know if you can see where the, the man is standing and next to him is this kind of what big, bigger than life-size um, icon of St. Nicholas. And you can see his head uh, made of wood at the top and he's dressed in the clothing of a, an Orthodox bishop. Um, and uh, the first mention of legal disputes being sorted out before this, this icon that we can see here of St. Nicholas dates back to the 1760s. And the ethnographer uh, Magnitsky wrote in 1881 that it is forbidden to use such depictions to avoid blasphemy. So in fact, kind of having depictions like this made of wood was considered blasphemy by the church at the time. Uh, but in Chaboksari, that's the capital where this, uh, this is, it stands open and is carried around the nearby villages on certain days. And people come to this icon to resolve their legal disputes. So in conclusion to this section, we can say that the many accounts of Kirimets and Orthodox holy places being visited at the same time reveal how Orthodox practices had been accommodated into the old ways rather than annihilating them. And the Chuvash folk healer, who was often the person who sent people to, uh, to the icons or to the churches, uh, played a role in this. And while the state and church hierarchy sought to restrict blasphemous practices associated with icons and sought to draw the Chuvash closer to more standard orthodox understandings of sacred location, early 20th century accounts suggest that non-standard practices relating to sacred locations continued until this time. Uh, now, I think perhaps I'll just have to, uh, I'll just summarize like in two words and we can go to the next slide just very briefly, um, the way that the, the missionaries referred to these kind of practices, to visiting the, uh, the Kirimets um, was on the whole uh, referred to as paganism or semi-savage rites, idolatry, devil worship. So in, in many ways, this kind of view of the mid vulgar peoples of them having this kind of ancient pagan faith um, to some extent is the result of the, uh, the missionaries terminology. And if you go to the next slide, um, and in fact, Ilminsky was was also kind of uh, kind of revolutionary in his view of this. In that, on the in the quote you can see here, he wrote that viewing the natives from the psychological point of view, it is strange for me that some missionaries persecute with every available method and try to destroy shamanistic beliefs and rites as if they were positively the work of the devil. In my opinion, these beliefs are no more than the aspiration to the divine and mystical impl implanted in human nature by the creator himself. Um, I think we'll, we'll miss out the next slide, which unfortunately is the, the views of, uh, <coughs> of the actual, uh, of, a, of a Chuvash priest about this, where he, he also um, 
kind of defended the the Juvash rites as actually being closer to uh, to monotheism, and he he challenged the fact that it was paganism or polytheism. Um, and anyway, just in very kind of brief conclusion. Um, uh, I'd like to say that um, popular religious practices in Orthodox Christian countries have perhaps been more prone to being interpreted as paganism, owing to Orthodox Christianity's holistic perception of the unity of the visible and, and invisible worlds, which is expressed, for example, in prayers for the consecration and blessing of water, grain and other food products. Um, and prayers to cast out evil spirits. And this unity of the material and spiritual world, worlds accounts for the role of icons, which from the point of view of Orthodox theology are spirit bearing matter. So for this reason, icons have often served a missionary role, uh, mediating God's presence and acting as teachers of the Christian faith among largely illiterate peoples before translations of Christian texts into local languages. Um, among the Chuvash, the sacred wood of the icons became an equivalent to the sacred trees of the Kidimet, and to some extent gradually replaced these sacred locations. Anyway, um, I mean, despite this kind of revival of, of local paganisms, um, the, the late 19th century vernacular translations into Tatar, Chuvash, and other mid Volga languages inspired by Olminsky have meant that among the peoples of the mid-Volga, Christian communities have survived the, the Soviet period and have re-emerged in a vibrant way in recent decades. And I'll, I'll finish there. Um, yes, and as, uh, <laughs> as uh, Rolf has said, I'm, yes, I'm happy to, I, I'm, I'd be very glad to hear your questions and uh, discuss anything. Yeah, thank you, uh, Alison. I'll just stop the share. Sorry, it's, it's I, as I say, I was a bit um, transfixed by the whole thing, so I lost track of time myself as well. Um, David, I know, has a question to, to ask, but I just want to thank you again for a fascinating insight, again, into a part of the world we know, most of us know little about, and so many of the issues that you're addressing as 19th century issues are, are hotly um, uh, contemporary issues for, for people, aren't they? So, very, very interesting. David, can I um, ask you to uh, pass on oh, your question? Yes, as softly as possible. I'm sorry I asked my first question a little bit too early uh, because uh, during the course of your lecture, you, in a sense, addressed uh, some of those uh, uh, issues that I had uh, in my mind. So you, you, you may choose to return to it uh, if, you, if you want to address anything that you think you haven't, or if you would like to add anything uh, in, res in response to that question, but I have another question. You, you asked that question. So, sorry, I didn't hear the first question. So it's well, it was, it, yeah, it, it, it was uh, sent to you by text. Uh, mm -hmm. But I have another question which I can ask, and that is to do with the exchange of ideas between the Orthodox missionaries. Uh, uh, I'm presuming that uh, the exchange of ideas between them um, or the exchanges of ideas between them, but probably not as good as uh, the exchanges of ideas between the Western missionaries working among Muslims in the 19th century. Um, so my question really is, how did Nikolai develop his um, uh, very innovative, very uh, new ideas and strategies without uh, you know, such interactions? At least we don't have evidence of uh, any active interactions between him and other missionaries like him in the same area. Uh, did he have, um, you know, um, uh, any specific sources that relied on for some of his ideas? Would you know any of those sources of his ideas? Did he have his own network of colleagues where he rehearsed these ideas, uh, perhaps before applying them in practice? Um. Yes. Do, do you mean his his ideas of of using the vernacular and of yeah, yeah. some of the, some of those ideas you mentioned in your lecture? So that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I mean, this has obviously been one of the the questions that I, I've most looked at, and I have been fascinated to 
kind of, you know, hear of almost exactly the same things. Um, I, I can't remember exactly the name of the translator in China um, in the 1830s. I heard a paper, I think, at the Yale Edinburgh conference about, you know, exactly the same time, really, of, of beginning to use uh, the vernacular uh, in Chinese translations. Um, I, I, th I think the thing is that uh, although we have a sense of Russia being kind of very separate from the Western churches. In fact, they were, they were very knowledgeable in what they knew. Um, uh, I've read quite a lot of the journals of the missionary organizations that they set up. And for example, they set up their own Orthodox Missionary Society, which was very much set up um, kind of you know following the example of the western missionary societies i mean you can read some of the orthodox missionaries of like the 1840s 1830s the people that we heard about from uh, from father michael in alaska and in their writings they say you know why have we not got a, an organization you know like the you know the kind of the british missionary society um and in fact, in, in their journals, particularly from the 1850s, 1860s, um, they have summaries of exactly what was going on in the missions in India, in Africa. I mean, a lot of them are translations from, you know, from the Western journals. So they were reading about all this kind of thing. And, and particularly um, Ilminski, um, he, he had access to those journals and he quotes some of them. And in fact, um, uh, in his main defense of using indigenous personnel, uh, he actually quotes the, the Western journals. Um, I mean, I can't actually give you the reference now, but I've actually been and looked it up and looked at the journal that he read, that he quotes to find out, you know, what was he actually reading about? And in fact, you know, it is the Western missions in, in India, in Africa. So, you know, he, he himself admits, I mean, it's funny because he, he says in the journal where he writes about this, he says, you know, far be it from me, you know, to look to the Western missionaries. He's almost kind of berating himself, you know, how could I possibly look to the Western missionaries? Um, but, you know, they are, you know, they have all these people being converted largely because they are working through the local people. So, um, you know, that, that was very definitely there. And, and, and as I mentioned in the lecture as well, I would say the general influence of the Russian Bible Society uh, was a huge influence. Um, and uh, the, the two men in particular that I mentioned, um, Metropolitan Filaret of Moscow and then Archbishop Grigori in Kazan, um, during the reign of uh, St. Nicholas, um, sorry, St. Nicholas, Tsar Nicholas I, which was from uh, 1825 to 1855, they really had to kind of go undercover. And there were this correspondence between them, you know, kind of encouraging each other and saying, you know, isn't it terrible that, you know, we've had to stop our vernacular translation work, which literally they'd had to stop in about 1825. Um, but there's, there's some wonderful passages, particularly from, uh, there's a man called um, uh, Makari Glukharyov, who was the man who founded the mission in the Altai Mountains. So on the other side from Mongolia, and he also introduced vernacular translations. And he wrote these wonderful letters to Metropolitan uh, Filaret of Moscow, you know, saying, well, you know, we might have been stopped, but, you know, there's no holding back the word of God. And, you know, and all, and again, looking to the example of Western translations, you know, he's saying that when, uh, you know, the word of God has been translated into the vernacular of this country, of that country and that country, you know, how are they going to stop the, it? the vernacular Russian. And in fact, the, um, the vernacular Russian Bible eventually was published in 1867 um, for the first time. So they had like 30 years of it all being put on hold. And then from the kind of mid 1850s, which is exactly the time that Ilminski came along and started suggesting we need vernacular translations, they started work on the actual Russian vernacular Bible. So Russia, in fact, 
you know, only had its own vernacular Bible from 1867, you know, so, uh, which is kind of quite amazing, really, for people from kind of Western European Reformation countries, where obviously it was happening much earlier. But yes, so yes, just I go back to your question, I hope I've answered it, that, you know, there was a very strong influence uh, of the Western missionaries, yeah. And it's not really publicized very much, but I mean, it's something I've been particularly interested in, obviously, it's coming from, from the UK. Um, I, I, look, looking at the time, we, we probably should stop unless there's a quick question from, from anybody else. Um, I'm, I'm wanting to ask Ruth, is um, the, the, your research work, um, in, what, is it, in what form is it published or is it not yet published? And, and, when, when might we expect something we could put on the bookshelves as SMS for people to access? Um, That's a very good question. I, I, I should have written my book on this many years ago. Um, right. And I mean, it's partly my own, I don't know, my own lack of organisation. Perhaps a kind of, I, I, I think, uh, I mean, I'd really request your kind of prayers and uh, kind of moral support. I, I think partly, to be honest, it's a kind of sense of there not being that interest there in the Orthodox world. You know, there's, wow. there's not, you know, I don't have the benefit of an OCMS around me, uh, you know, prodding me along. And so, I mean, unfortunately, I do have a few people around me who, you know, kind of believe in this and realize that it, mm. it would be wonderful to have this uh, eventually published. Um, but I, I, I mean, I am trying to work on a book, basically. Yeah. But I can't, kind of, I can't, yeah. I can't offer to publish it from through through Regnum. But I suggest that that um, which is the OCMS um, yeah. uh, publishing room. But if if you're looking for somewhere to give you some prods, I think we could probably generate some some uh, momentum from OCMS if that's of interest. Because I think it, it, it would be, it would yeah. be, yeah. I mean, it, it is really what I need, you know. I, yeah. I, to somebody to say this is interesting and we would like to have this because at think, times you know you kind of feel like nobody's interested to be honest um well yeah. we might be small but we are <laughs> <laughs> you, you could you. start you Thank could probably you. start with a couple of particles can i comment transformation so, can i comment yeah. yes please can i can't I, see who that is again it's, it's roger it's, yes um for 40 years or so, I've supported Keston College or Keston Institute. They have now uh, gone to Baylor University. I don't know whether Baylor would actually be able to help you in that, mm. but if they were, it would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you for that suggestion. Um, yes, my, my own kind of uh, journey for a while, I, I, I worked for about two years for Aid to Russian Christians. This was in the 1980s, which was set up by the Keston researcher. Um, right. So, so I am kind of, you know, I, I do know about Keston and the fact that they're now in the States. Um, yeah. and, and they have they have money in the States and you have to, <coughs> you have to be um, proactive. Right, right. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes, thank you. All best wishes for that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. I'll stop the recording now. I should have stopped it probably before then, but. Uh...